بسم الله الرحمن الرحيم أن الحمد لله نحمده ونستعينه ونستغفره ونعوذ بالله من شرور أنفسنا ومن سيئات أعمالنا ما يهده الله فلا مضل له ومن يضل فلا هادي له وأشهد أن لا إله إلا الله وحده لا شريك له وأشهد أن محمدا عبده ورسوله صلى الله عليه وعلى آله وسلم تسليما كثيرا أما بعد فإن خير الكلام كلام الله وخير الهدى هدى رسول الله صلى الله عليه وسلم وشر الأمور محدثاتها وكل محدثة بدعة وكل بدعة ضلالة وكل ضلالة في النار Today is the 16th of Sha'ban and we're dealing with the mistakes that are apparent and quite popular amongst those who pray. So before dealing with today's few issues, topics, I'd like to inform you that one of the ulama of the sunnah, he has died recently, today, yesterday. I just got the news actually. His name is Mukhtar al-Shinqiti. He was from the Usuliyin to this Ummah. And any time a scholar dies, it's a sign and indication that Yawm al-Qiyamah is close. As the Prophet sallallahu alayhi wa sallam mentioned to his companions, may Allah be pleased with them into this Ummah, that Allah azza wa jal will not take the knowledge at one time out of the hearts of the people, but He'll take the knowledge from the earth by causing the scholars to die. So when the Salaf used to hear about the death of a man from the Sunnah or a scholar of this religion, it used to affect them, it used to impact them because the Ummah is in dire need of ulama. One of the signs of Yawm al-Qiyam is knowledge will become a little. So already the Ummah, we have many, many people tens of millions of people, billion people, but the percentage of ulama for the ummah may be less than 1%, Allahu alam. So with the big numbers that we have, the ummah is in need of people who know, because those who know are not like those who don't know. So we ask Allah Azza wa Jal to give his rahmah and his maghfira to the Sheikh Mukhtar al-Shinqiti and to also leave for us and make a connection for us with those ulama who are present, but to be connected to them in a way that's been legislated, not to be connected to them in a way that goes against the teachings that the Prophet brought, sallallahu alayhi wa sallam, like al-ghulu, and having a taqlid, taqlid al-a'ma, when an individual has the ability to choose the right position that a particular scholar may have made a mistake in. So we have to be connected to the ulama, but connected to the ulama in the right way. We have to love the ulama, and we have to love the ulama in a right way. Anybody who comes in your environment and he's speaking bad about the scholars of Al-Islam, irregardless of their mistakes that they made here or there, then you should run away from that individual, the one, the same way you would run away from Ebola or leprosy or something like that. Because that person who is in opposition to the ulama of Al-Islam he is in essence his lisanul hal. His condition says that he is in opposition to this religion because the scholars are the inheritors of the prophets and the prophets did not leave anything to be inherited with the exception of knowledge. Salawatullahi wassalamu alayhim ajma'in. And our Nabi and our Rasul, sallallahu alayhi wasallam, he left behind knowledge to be inherited. He didn't leave behind any or any dirham. So again, let's stay connected to the ulama of Islam, but connected in the right way. Concerning the last points that we left off with, they were dealing with the sufuf and making the salat in the jama'ah from the common errors that you'll find, and I bring this to your attention so that we won't fall into this mistake because a person may do this mistake Unintentionally, he just really is not paying attention. So as Allah mentioned in the Quran, فذكر, remind them, remind them. 
in the المؤمنين. A person didn't know. And then when he's reminded, he starts to act upon that issue. But from those mistakes is for a person to come into the masjid early and instead of going straight to the first row, he prays in the fifth, sixth, seventh row. He stays in the back of the masjid unnecessarily. He allows himself to become busy and preoccupied over the number one thing that he should be doing. And the number one thing that he should be doing is come into the first row. That's what he should be doing. When you get to the masjid, the goal and the objective is to get as many rewards as possible. And it's the sunnah of the Nabi as you're going to see, sallallahu alayhi wa sallam, to go straight to the first row. What's the proof of that? There are a number of adilla, and what was collected by Imam al-Bukhari, a Muslim, Abu Hurara, may Allah be pleased with him, and may the rahmah of Allah be upon the ulama of the sunnah, and Imam al-Bukhari and Imam Muslim. Lo ya'lamu nasu ma fi nida'i wa saf al-awwal, thumma nam yajidu illa an yastahimu alayhi lastahamu. If the people knew in Bashir, may Allah be pleased with him and his father, and what was collected by Al Imam Ahmed, Rahmatullahi alayhi, he said that the Nabi mentioned Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam in Allah wa Malaikatuhu Yusalluna ala Safil Awal. Allah and his messenger, Allah and the Malaika, they send salutations on the people who pray in the first row. They send salutations. The Malaika, they ask Allah to forgive him. And how many are the number of the Malaika? And Allah Azawajal's sal- salutations is salawat, so that he forgives them. So the first row puts you in a position of having the malaika to give the salawat, the dua for you, for your maghfirah, for Allah's rahmah upon you. And Allah Azawajal forgives the people who also do this particular issue. Lastly, Khwani, is the hadith of Sahih Muslim, Abu Hurara, may Allah be pleased with him, he said that the Nabi mentioned sallallahu alayhi wa sallam khayru sufuf al-rijali awaluha wa sharruha akhiruha wa khayru sufuf al-nisai akhiruha wa khayruha awaluha wa sharruha awaluha The best line for the men to pray in are the first lines and the worst line for the men to pray in the last line the best line for the women to pray in is the last line. And the best and the worst line for the women to pray in is the first line of the women. So the last line of the men and the first line of the women, they're the two worst lines. And when we say the worst lines, that's relative to the other lines. That last line of the men is better than the one who is praying in his house. So it's not like the line is inherently evil. It's evil or it's the sharp. It's the line that is the worst line because of the illa that is there. The close proximity between the men and the women. The ulama of Islam said though if the women were praying by themselves and there were no men, then the hadith that the best line for the men is the first line is applicable to the women as well because there are only women there. They say that the reason or the illa or the reason for this particular information that we're receiving, the illa is because of the close proximity. This is one of the criticisms that the ulama have against the people of the Zahiri Madhab. Although that Madhab is mu'tabr and is bona fide and is beneficial, and many times they got it right against all of the other Madhab, but one of the things they didn't do is they didn't consider all the time what's the illa. Before you can take a hadith or an ayat for face value, you have to know why is the ruling in that ayat or that hadith? What is the background and the context of that ayat or that hadith? So if the illa goes away, then the ruling is going to change. So the women in the masjid, the best line for them is to be far away from the men. And the worst line for them is to be closest to the men. So that's a proof and that's a delil that goes and it shows that the best line is for the man to pray in the first line. The Prophet came to the Masjid Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam and he saw two men in the back speaking. And they were not coming to the Saf. Everybody else was preparing to make the Salat and they were getting in the Saf lining up 
and they were taking their time. He told the people, Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam, لا يزال قوم يتأخرون حتى يؤخرهم الله حتى يؤخرهم الله Some people would not cease to take their time coming to the Saf. Some people will continue to come very slowly and gingerly, lollygagging, until Allah will make them last. Allah will give them the ta'khir. And what's the meaning of Allah giving them the ta'khir? They'll be the last of the people to get his rahmah. They'll be the last of the people to get his fadl, his ihsan. They'll be the last of the people to get his maghfirah. So all of those are proofs and indications of the virtues of being in the first line. Now if he told us to be in the first line, there's going to be benefits of being in the first line. You'll hear the qira'ah of the imam better. You won't be distracted the way people who are in the back are distracted because all you have to worry about is who's to your right and your left. But when you are in the middle of the saf or the masjid, the man who's in front of you, he makes sajda, he makes rukur, and his aura is showing right in front of you. For an example, people are moving all about. So the people in the first row are the people who get the most important aspect of the prayer. Another issue from the mistakes connected to this is, in the first row, the people who should pray behind the imam are the people who are the most knowledgeable of the community, knowledgeable of the Qur'an. So some of you who find yourselves in the first row, you have to look around in the masjid to see if there's someone who memorized the Qur'an, someone who has more knowledge of you, but especially he knows the Qur'an. And if you see that that is the case, you should say to him, you come, you come. That's the job and responsibility of the imam, but no problem. We'll take responsibility for that, especially when we see in our masjid there's a lot of falling short of the mark concerning many aspects of the sunnah. We go to Mecca, we go to Medina. That's one place where the imam should take more time to straighten out the row. But the imams in Mecca and Medina, غَفَرَ اللَّهُ لَنَا وَلَهُمْ وَرَضِيَ اللَّهُ عَنَّا وَعَنْهُمْ We'll find that in that place they say, Allahu Akbar, and just start. Does that mean that you and I, we can't say, hey, hey, straighten up the line, you do your best? No, you do your best. Al-Amru bin Ma'roof and Al-Nahi on Munkar. So in this masjid, there are many aspects of the sunnah that are being compromised and are not being taken care of. So the students especially, those from amongst you, with leniency and easiness, you make these points. You let that person come. Even if you came before him and there's no more space and you give him your space and you go to the back, you'll get that reward of being in the Saf al-Awwal you'll also get the reward of bringing that sunnah back to life as well. And then the hadith of the Prophet sallallahu minhu. Anyone who leaves something for Allah's sake, Allah will give him better than what he left. So you're leaving something because it's in the sunnah. You're leaving something because you know what your niyyat was. So that's the fiqh of al-Islam. So those are the first two mistakes. From the mistakes of Khwani, big muscular mistake is the mistake of putting the kids behind the men and in front of the women. Whether those kids are big enough to pray or not big enough to pray. But we're going to focus right now on the kids who are old enough to pray. They're 10, 11, some maybe 8, 9. So in some masajid, it is from the culture of the people that automatically, when they start to line up, the young man better not get in the row with the rijal. He's, in their eyes, making a kabira from the kabair. They will look at him strangely, and if it's your boy, they may think that you're not teaching him the deen, and he has no respect. No. The kid is allowed to stay in the row, even if he's six years old, if he knows what he's doing. Seven years old, little man, little shorty, he knows what he's doing. They do this relying on a hadith that says that the Prophet says, Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam, or the companion said, Can a Nabi Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam yaj al rijal quddam al ghilman, wal ghilman khalfuhum, wal nisa khalf al ghilman. The Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam, he used to put the men in front of the youngsters, and he would put the youngsters. Behind the men. 
and he will put the women or saw to it that the women were behind the youngsters. Now, no doubt, that is the right tartib. But there's no delil that there's a specific area for the youngsters, especially those who know what they're doing. One of the companions, his name is Amr ibn Salama, radiallahu anhu, his tribe came to the Prophet to learn the religion, sallallahu alayhi wa sallam, wa radiallahu anhum ajma'in. And he told them, when you go back, let the one who knows the most Quran lead you in the prayer. So that little boy said, we looked around and it turned out that I memorized more Quran than everybody else. So they made me their imam in the prayer. And I was only six years old at that particular time. So if he's six years old and he can lead the people in the prayer, then if he's six years old and he knows how to pray, he can pray in the saf. As for the child that doesn't have wudu, then he can't be in the saf at all. He can't be in the saf at all. Maybe he's all the way at the end because no one can get in that spot because it's so small. So he could be at the end where his dad is, where his father is, so that he can be supervised. The kid who he doesn't know how to pray or he doesn't have wudu or a little girl, they shouldn't be in the suf at all. As for those children who come to the masjid and they don't know what they're doing, should we put them in the middle? Well, that's something that the administration of the masjid has to look at. That's something that the jama has to look at. Because if those little guys get together while it's time for prayer, it's party time with them. So you're trying to avoid one problem, and then you open up a door for another problem. That is the party time problem. So the point is, if we're going to teach them how to pray, and we're going to put them back there by themselves, they won't know how to pray. They won't know how to pray. We should bring those kids put them at the end as much as possible put them at the end put them between us and don't leave them back there uh, to uh, fool around and to mess about so that's the third khata from the mistakes from the mistakes and uh, alhamdulillah was being uh, transported to the masjid today by one of our brothers uh, Afdal and he was mentioning that he benefited from some of the things that were mentioned in this class and I told them, this is why we're giving the class. Some people, they want you to come, and every time they give you a talk, people want their kufis to blow off their heads and their socks to blow off their feet. And then if you were to do this and you touch it, it goes, Psss, because it was so hot with the talk that he gave. No, just leave our religion simple and easy. Inshallah, we'll get some lessons like that from some people here and there. Inshallah, the khutbat al Juma sometimes will be like that in this Sometimes from different people. As for every single talk, that's what we're expecting? No. The goal the objective of these types of durus is to raise off ourselves ignorance. So that we'll be put in a position of empowering ourselves to worship Allah, knowing what we're doing. Knowing what we're doing. So the next mistake, Ikhwani, is the mistake of people who pray between the rows or between the columns. And we gave... Two weeks ago, a whole dars about the columns and what those columns are for. So the Nabi sallallahu alayhi wa sallam used to prohibit his companions from praying in the saf and the column breaks the row. So you see the column right there. That column is made for what that brother is doing right now, to lean your back against that column. That column is there so that you can use it as a sutra. As we mentioned, the way the companions used to deal with that column. But when you pray in the Salat al Jamaat in this masjid or any other masjid, do your best not to pray where you're on either side of the column. We line up, and we line up from this column to the last part, and no one gets on the other side. The only time we get on the other side is when there's extreme zahma. If there's a lot of people, there's a crowd, then you have to get in where you fit in. And remember, that principle in Al-Islam, when you are in a case where you're being compelled, then Al-Islam makes things easy for you. When things get def- difficult, Al-Islam came to make things easy. One of our brothers, he's in the university and he has to do his dissertation. He has to defend his last risala that uh, he puts forward to get his degree. 
So the lady who's going to look over and supervise is a risala. Is not his, he's not a mahram for her. So he says, I'm not going to go to sit to defend it because the Prophet says, Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam, a man and a woman shouldn't be together alone except shaitan is the third of them. So he went through the university four years and now he doesn't get his degree because he doesn't want to disobey Allah in that issue. I say, hey, don't disobey Allah. If you could do something about it, do something about it. Hey, can I have a male mushrif? No. Um, can someone else be there? No. Okay. Then I'm going to hate it in my heart and I'm going to go there without even letting it bother me because I have to be on point in terms of defending the thing. So if there is necessity, then what can you do? So on the day of Juma, on the day of Taraweeh, on the day of Al Eid, when there are a lot of people, then it's permissible to pray in there. Because what else are we going to do? But normally you shouldn't do that. Abdullah bin Mas'ud, he saw the people doing that. He told them, Radiallahu anhu, la tasufu bayna sawari. Don't make your lines and you have these columns between you. So if in a masjid, like in this masjid, on Friday, the people want to pray over there, it's okay. But on these regular prayers, don't do it. And if you're in the masjid and you're hearing what I'm saying, you're in a masjid and your masjid is one in which there's not a lot of room. So the people, they line up and then they're on either side of the columns and they don't have to be. Then we say, move the row back or the row begins where that column begins unless there are a lot of people who happen to be there. And that brings another issue, Lekhwani, about some of the things about how when we get away from the simplicity of what the Prophet brought, Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam, we create issues where we kill the sunnah. And as those scholars used to say in the past, anybody who kills a sunnah or anybody who innovates in the religion, he's going to kill the sunnah in the process. Any innovation that is presented in the religion, that innovation is going to kill something that's from the sunnah. And this is one of the problems with innovation. Imam Ibn Kathir, he said, Ahl sunnah the people of the sunnah, those people who say any and everything that the companions did not do in this religion, if they didn't do it, and it didn't have a delil for it, and they didn't do it, then it is a bid'ah. And that's because those companions didn't leave off any good thing, except if it was correct, they were the first ones to do it. So when we go to some masjids, especially in the Muslim world, you'll find a gigantic member, a big gigantic member. It costs a lot of money in and of itself. It extends five rows down. So on Friday or during the time of prayer, it has to break the row. We don't need that member like that. What we need are the rows to be connected. And this is something that we find in the way you're going to build the message in Islam. You have to take into consideration the Prophet he built a message, sallallahu alayhi wa sallam, and his companions did that as well. So don't compromise the sufuf. Don't compromise. Now we come to some of the mistakes of Khwani and there a lot in terms of things that people are saying. And we're also dealing with the jama'ah still. Mazilna in the issue of the mistakes dealing with the jama'ah. And from that is what Sheikh al-Islam al-Thani ibn al-Qayyim said. He said from the mistakes that people make in their recitation of the Quran is that a person never, ever, ever, ever says Bismillah ar-Rahman rahim out loud for Salat al-Fajr, Salat al-Maghrib, Salat al-Isha. He claimed and he said that the Prophet did that, sallallahu alayhi wa sallam, sometimes. But he used to keep it quiet most of the time. He wouldn't say Bismillah ar-Rahman ar-Rahim out loud most of the time. So Ibn al-Qayyim said, for a person to always say Bismillah ar-Rahman ar-Rahim under his breath is not the complete sunnah. But he should do Bismillah ar-Rahman ar-Rahim out loud sometimes. Imam Sufyan al-Thawri, rahimahullah ta'ala, when the man came to him to ask him about the aqid of Ahl sunnah And he said, I'm going to ask you, ya Imam Sufyan al-Thawri, some questions that you're going to be questioned in front of Allah. I'm going to tell Allah, Sufyan al-Thawri told me this. I come to you to ask you about the aqid and the minhaj of Al-Islam. And Allah, when he asked me, Yom al-Qiyamah, say that you told me this. So he said, what is the aqid of Ahl sunnah Tell me these things. 
He said, you should know that you won't be from Ahl Sunnah until you see the permissibility of saying Bismillah rahman rahim in your salat. And he said, you should do that over the other thing. Now, there's no doubt that the Prophet sallallahu alayhi wa sallam, he didn't say Bismillah rahman rahim as much. I didn't find that hadith that Ibn al-Qayyim was mentioning where he said the Nabi did it. As a matter of fact, some of the companions said and some of the tabi'een said that the Prophet sallallahu alayhi wa sallam did not say Bismillah rahman rahim nor did Abu Bakr after him, nor did Umar after him. But he's from the ulama, so the point is, there's a khtilaf in the issue. Some ahadith established as some of the companions believed this. Ibn Abbas, that was his position, that was his opinion. Ali ibn Abi Talib, that was his opinion. There's a narration, Umar, radiallahu anhu, that was his position. So you have some of the companions believing that, and some of the tabi'een doing that. So we should do this sometimes, and the other one, the majority of the time, inshallah, azwajal. From those mistakes as well, ikhwani, in the recitation of the Qur'an, it's for the individual to read Surah Al-Fatiha in one nafis. He starts and he says, Allahu Akbar. He does the dua al-istiftah that we mentioned. And then he says, A'udhu billahi min shaitan rajim bismillah rahman rahim And then he says, Alhamdulillahi Rabbil Alameen Ar-Rahman Ar-Rahim Maliki Yawm Al-Din Iyaka Na'budu Wa Iyaka Nasta'een Ihdina Sirat Al-Mustaqeem Sirat Al-Ladheena Namta Alayhim Ghayr Al-Makdubi Alayhim Ar-Dhaleen Ameen That's something that should be avoided Because the recitation of the Nabi Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam was He would read each ayat by himself By itself And he didn't connect ayats like that Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam and the companions who heard him make his recitation, they said when he recited, he recited the beginning of each ayat to the end of that ayat. And when he ended the ayat, he would elongate the recitation. Alhamdulillahi Rabbil Alameen, Ar-Rahman Ar-Rahim, Maliki Yawm Al-Deen, Iyaka Na'budu wa Iyaka Nasta'een. So you shouldn't read the whole thing in one tanafus, in one nafis. But each ayat should be read individually so that we can have at-tadabbur and at-ta'amul with the kalam of Allah and we can respect the kalam of Allah. And some of the salaf used to say when people read the Qur'an, they used to say, he didn't read the Qur'an. The man came and said, I read Surah Al-Baqarah and I can read it just in like one salat. Abdullah ibn Umar said, you didn't read the Qur'an. For me to read ten ayat slowly, understand and comprehend what they are saying, is more beloved to me to read the whole Qur'an in one night, reading it very fast. And some of the ulama of the salaf used to say, reading the Qur'an very quickly is disrespect to the Qur'an. And it's taking the Qur'an as play and jest. Don't take the ayat of Allah as play and gesture. Come to another very important issue from what is quite prevalent. And that is this thing about the Ameen. The thing about the Ameen. So I need you guys to pay attention, inshallah, azwajal, so you can understand the point. The Ameen has been established by the Prophet sallallahu alayhi wasallam. He himself did it, and he also commanded the community to say Ameen. So whenever the Imam prays, as our youngster, the young brother, he prayed, and he said, Ameen. The Imam should say, Ameen. And the Jamaat should say, Ameen. If the person is praying by himself, if he's praying by himself, then it's highly recommended that he says, Ameen. It's highly recommended. It's recommended. Because Surah Al-Fatiha is a dua. As for the Jamaat, then this is something that should happen. He says, Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam, إِذَا أَمَّنَ الْإِمَامُ فَأَمِّنُوا فَإِنَّهُ مَنْ وَافَقَ تَأْمِينُهُ تَأْمِينَ الْمَلَائِكَةِ غُفِرَ لَهُ مَا تَقَدَّمَ مِنْ ذَنْبِهِ If the Imam says, Ameen, then you people say, Ameen. For verily, who's, whoever says, Ameen, and that Ameen coincides with the Malaika, who also, when the Imam says, Ameen, they say, Ameen. So if you say it at the same time that they say it, 
Allah will forgive him for his sins that went before. So the people come and they say, hey, these issues are small issues. You get your minor sins taken off by just being on top of the situation and paying attention, waiting for the imam. So in some of the masajid, like the people on the Hanafi madhab, who have been affected by the fiqh of the people of Al-Kufa, the Kofiyun, the people of Al-Kufa, they were of the opinion you shouldn't say Ameen. Although their delils are either weak or they don't prove the point. They're weak or they don't prove the point. So the vast majority of the ulama, Al-Imam Malik, Al-Imam Shaf, Al-Imam Ahmed, the jamahir of the ulama and the fuqaha are of the opinion that the Ameen is from this religion and it is important. It's an issue that the Prophet says, Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam, لا تحسدكم اليهود على شيء مثل حسدهم على تأمينكم. Those Jews, the Yehud, they are not jealous and envious of you people more than anything in your religion than saying Ameen. So in Al Medina, if you were in Medina during the time of the Nabi Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam, and the Imam said Ameen Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam, the Community will say, Ameen. There's a hadith that said that the building would shake and reverberate. That's not true. But you can hear the loudness of that Ameen. The unity, the togetherness, worshiping Allah together. The fact that they are making a collective community dua for Allah to give them this thing that they're asking for. Making them different from the Yehud and the Nasara. When the Yehud used to hear that. They used to get upset. They used to get upset. Look at that brotherhood. Look at this religion. And so forth and so on. So that's a clear proof. Ikhwani that I mean it's from the salat. Something that should be done. And it's similar to the Rafa Liyadain. We prayed over the brother recently. Our brother Abdi. May Allah Azza wa put him in the Jannat al firdaus Make it easy for his family to deal with his loss. People in the Medhab, Hanafi Medhab, and this is just showing just the contradictions, not to put the madhab down. But they're of the opinion that in the Salat of Al-Janazah, you do raf'ul yadain, although the Prophet didn't do it. It's not a single hadith saying he did it, sallallahu alayhi wa sallam, for the janazah. Not a single hadith. Who was the companion who did raf'ul yadain, Sharif? Abdullah ibn Umar. Abdullah ibn Umar, he did Raf'ul Yadain. And Abdullah ibn Umar was the companion who was known, mashhur, ma'roof, that he was trying to do everything that the Prophet did, sallallahu alayhi wa sallam. So since no other companion is going against his Raf'ul Yadain in the janazah, since you don't think he'll be doing that on his own, we say, okay, anybody who wants to do Raf'ul Yadain, Abdullah ibn, Mas- Abdullah ibn Umar, he did it. So the Hanafi Madhab, they say you should do Raf al Yadain in the Janazah, and there's no delil that the Prophet did it, Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam. But then in the prayer that you make every day, they say you shouldn't do Raf al Yadain. You shouldn't do Raf al Yadain. And the delil for that is clear. The delil here and no delil there. So it just goes to show when you follow the Madhab, you have to follow the Madhab with Basira and with knowledge. With Basira and with knowledge. And don't anybody think that I'm having a dig at the Hanafi Madhab. We told you too many times that the Hanafi Madhab, they had ulama of the Sunnah who spread the Sunnah. And then Imam Abu Hanifa himself is one of the ulama of Ahl Sunnah, inshallah, from the ulama who we love, honor, and we respect. So if you happen to be in a masjid where the Imam doesn't say Ameen, then don't say Ameen. Because the Hadith said, if the imam says ameen, then you say ameen. For verily, whoever the malaika, their ameen coincides with his, he will be forgiven. So if the imam doesn't say ameen, you don't have to say ameen. You shouldn't say ameen, even in our masjid. So we're going to wait until the imam says, غير المغضوب عليهم والضالين. We don't say ameen as soon as he says والضالين. We wait as soon as he says uh, then we start <coughs> we start to say it after him so that's one of the mistakes don't race the imam in his ta'meen 
Let him say it first. If he says it, then we should say it. If he doesn't say it, then you don't have to say it, especially in those messages where they don't do it. Better to not do it because there's a condition that the Prophet said, Sallallahu Alaihi wa ala alihi wa sallam. The last issue for today, Ikhwani bi idhnillahi, from the recitations and the mistakes connected to the recitation is when people read the statement of Allah Azza and then when people, the imam reads that, people say, Bala wa ana ala dhalika min shahideen. Bala, the ayah says, isn't Allah the best of those who judge? He is ahkamul hakimin. Those people who give a hukam and they judge and rule, Allah is the best of those who judge. So when that ayat is read, it is common in the Muslim world, just like people add on Sayyidina, Allahumma salli ala Sayyidina Muhammad, and we went through that, the hadith of Al-Bara ibn Azib, before you go to bed, Ya Bara, make this dua, Amantu bi nabiyyi kalladhi arsalta, and don't say Amantu bi rasuli kalladhi arsalta, Amen to be Nabi Kaladi or Salta. Stick to the text. Al Ibada, that word I told you before, Toki Fia. Don't go and do any Ibada without Delil. What's that word again? Toki Fia. That's a word from the vocabulary in Al Islam. The student of knowledge has to know. Toki Fia from Waqafa. Toki Fia. Stop. Don't do any ibadah. Don't do any aqidah. Don't do anything. Yesterday, Shabbarat. So we're going to make special fast, special prayer, special this, special that. Did the Prophet do it, sallallahu alayhi wa sallam? No, he didn't do it, but he said that this was a virtuous night. Okay, if that's what he said, let's stick to what he said and don't add on to what he said. Because if this was something that it had some khayr in it, those companions would have done it. Radi Allah anhum. The Prophet would have told us about it. Sallallahu alayhi wa ala alihi wa sallam. So this ayat, alayhi sallallahu bi ahkam al hakimin, is asking a rhetorical question. And it's not for you to answer that. There are many ayats of the Quran that are asking questions. The Imam, he reads, Afillahi shak. Is there any doubt about Allah? And we're in the thing, we say, Kalla. Did you not see those people? Yes, we saw them. And you just, we turn the salat into something else. Every time there's a question, we are, we're answering the question with something. No. There is one delil that the Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam on one issue, one ayat, he allowed the people to speak about this question. And that's the statement of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, أَلَيْسَ ذَلِكَ بِقَادِرًا عَلَىٰ إِنْ يُحْيِيَ الْمَوْتَىٰ Isn't Allah in Surah Al-Insan? هَلْ أَتَىٰ عَلَىٰ الْإِنسَان Surah Al-Qiyamah, huh? Hmm? أَلَيْسَ ذَلِكَ بِقَادِرًا عَلَىٰ إِنْ يُحْيِيَ الْمَوْتَىٰ isn't Allah the one who is capable of giving life to the dead? When the Prophet used to read that, Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam, the people behind him would say, Subhanaka, Fabala, Subhanaka, Fabala. Yes, Subhanaka, you're capable of doing this. A man was reading in his house, and the people behind him said that, and the Prophet heard it, and he allowed it. Sallallahu alayhi wa sallam. The ayat in Surah Ar-Rahman. فَبِأَيِّ آلَاءِ رَبِّكُمَا تُكَذِّبَانِ It's not for us to say anything, but the jinn, the jinn themselves, when that ayat was being read, they would say, the jinn would say, we won't deny any of the favors of our Lord. But we shouldn't do that. Which brings me to the other issue, brother, two issues. One issue is about the... Companions described him sallallahu alayhi wa sallam and they said that when he used to read the Quran, he used to seek refuge in Allah from his adab. If he came across an ayat about adab, 
If you came across an ayat about al-jannah or rahmah, he used to ask the ask Allah Azza wa to give him the rahmah and the jannah. So should we do that? He used to do that during the nighttime prayer. During the daytime prayer, the Prophet didn't do that, sallallahu alayhi wa sallam. Another issue, but I have to go back. When it just came to me, Sabbihisma Rabbikal A'la. People say Subhanallah on Friday. The Imam says, Sabbihisma Rabbikal A'la. Allah has commanded, make the speech of your Lord the Most High. So you hear in the Masajid of Al Hadith, Subhanallah. Is that from the Sunnah? And maybe we need to look at this thing a little another time. Allahu A'lam. Maybe we need to study this issue. The Nabi sallallahu alayhi wa ala alayhi wa sallam used to make these du'as for the nighttime prayer. There's a general rule that the scholar said the fard prayer and the naf, the, the, the nawaf, the sunan, they're the same. You do the same in both of them unless a delil comes. So for the fard prayer, you have to stand up. But for the nawafil, you don't have to stand up. You can pray sitting down. If you want to, you can pray sitting down. For the fard prayer, you have to face the qibla. You have to face the qibla. He sallallahu alayhi wa sallam was praying salatul witr on his horse. And the horse would be towards the qibla and turn away from the qibla. So those are distinctions that were allowed. So he said during the night prayer, Allah, give me your jannah. Allah, give me your rahmah. Allah, forgive me. Allah, I seek refuge in you from this adab and from the hellfire. But we don't find him doing that in the daytime prayer. So I'm going to have some tawakkuf on that. And inshallah, you brothers go and research that and come back with what you have. We do Q&A for about five minutes, inshallah. And again, want to welcome the brothers back uh, who just came back from uh, Umrah. May Allah Azza wa accept it from you. And uh, allow us to go to Umrah pretty soon as well. And for the students as well who have come back, our students who are staying in Medina uh, are back now. So we're going to encourage you brothers to uh, benefit from these brothers throughout the month of Ramadan. They're going to be giving their talks and things like that. So one of the brothers, Kashif, who went to Umrah, he said he was with a group of people. And his question was, in the group of people that he was with, the people were trying to pray 40 prayers in the prophet's masjid, 40 prayers, because they were saying if you could get 40 prayers in the masjid, prophet's masjid, you go to Jannah or some, some special thing. I don't know about that. I don't know. I don't think that's true. I don't think that's true. The one that I know that is true is the hadith of the prophet, sallallahu alayhi wa sallam, man salla lillahi salatan, man salla lillahi salatan, arba'ina yawmin, Anyone who prays for Allah, he prays for Allah 40 days, 40 days in Jama'ah, and he doesn't miss the Takbiratul Ihram. He will be given two things, two protections. One, He'll be protected from the hellfire. Two, he'll be protected from hypocrisy. But he has to bring those three or those four conditions. Four, he has to pray with ikhlas for Allah. He's in the masjid in the first row. He's doing what he's doing for Allah. He prays 40 days, 40 days, not 40 prayers, 40 days. So that's 200 prayers. Number three, he does it in the jama'ah. And number four, he has to get the takbiratul ihram. So if the imam says, Allahu Akbar, he has to be there for that. And some of the scholars said, as long as he catches before the dua al-istiftah begins, or before the recitation, then he got the takbiratul ihram. And some of those salaf, they used to be in the masjid, and they wouldn't miss the takbiratul ihram for 40 years, 60 years, not 40 days, 40 years, 60 years. And they wouldn't miss the takbiratul ihram. Wala hawla wala quwwata illa billah. So, now we're in Sha'ban, the 16th of Sha'ban. A person can try now. Don't just wait for Ramadan. Inshallah, it starts right now. I want to get 
Ramadan 30 days, 29 days, inshallah, I'm going to try to get Sha'ban, get those four. This is a hadith I'm going to try to practice. I'm going to try to get this hadith. So that was for my man Kashif. Any more questions, Ikhwani? Fadl ya akhi Abdul Qadir. Concerning the recitation of Surah of the Basmana, Bismillah ar-Rahman ar-Rahim, majority of the scholars said Bismillah ar-Rahman ar-Rahim is an ayat from every surah of the Quran with the exception of the 11th surah, Surah At-Tawbah and bara But every other surah begins with Bismillah ar-Rahman ar-Rahim, so you have to read it. But then other scholars said no, because the Prophet said, Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam, that Allah said in the Hadith Al-Qudsi, Qasamtu As-Salat, Nusfain. I have divided the prayer into two parts. One part is for Allah, one part is for the slave. So when the slave says, Alhamdulillah, Rabbil Alameen, Allah says that his slave may thana on him. So the first ayat that Allah said, if the slave reads, Alhamdulillah, Rabbil Alameen. So why didn't he read Bismillah Rahman Rahim? So it's an, it's an issue of ikhtilaf, and, and as we mentioned, the majority of the ulama said that it is a surah, an ayat from the Quran, so we should read it. Tafadri akhi Muhammad Jami'ah. No, I never said that because I said Ibn Qayyim, he said that, but I never saw where the Prophet did that, sallallahu alayhi wa sallam, but the companions said, he never said Bismillah ar-Rahman rahim But Ibn Qayyim, he said, he did say it sometimes. I never saw that particular hadith. I never, but I know this issue is an issue of ikhtilaf. But uh, other companions said that uh, um, other companions took the position that you should say it. And from them, Ali, Ibn Abbas, and Umar. So I don't know that hadith. Tafadda. If the imam is not doing rafuli adain, then you should do it. Rafuli adain, unless it's going to cause problems, you know, you're praying with a group of people, your relatives, and they are creating problems, then rafuli adain is a sunnah from the sunan. It's not a rukun from the arkana of the salat. It's not a pillar. It's not a condition from the conditions of your prayer. If you leave it off intentionally, you don't have to do sajda tasahu, sajda tasahu. And we're going to do that sajjid to soul in the uh, fiqh of sajjid to soul, inshallah, down the line. Be idhni la akhi afdal. That's not thabit. The Nabi sallallahu alayhi wa sallam, he did raf ul yadain in his prayer, as we mentioned. And the people who take the other opinion. They rely on a hadith that are fabricated and they rely on reasons that are super absurd. They used to have idols under their arms, so they would do rough earlier day to drop the idols. And then after they got iman and tawheed, they didn't have idols anymore, so they didn't do rough earlier day anymore. That's super absurd. Or they rely on something that is authentic. But it's not showing the position. It's not showing the point. They were praying in the tashahud. They were in the tashahud. And the people, his, his arms were moving around. They were moving. And the Prophet wasallam said, What is it that I see your arms moving like the tails of wild donkeys? So they say, this hadith, for raf al you move your hands like wild donkey tails. That hadith was mentioned because they went to tashahud. So they'll mention something that is sahih, but it's not sarih. It's not doing the point. Or they'll mention something that's whacked out, it's weak, fabricated. Or they'll mention something that is bizarre. Why? Because he's drowning in his medhat. So whenever you drown in your medhat, 
You got to survive, man, when it's just easy. Follow the sunnah and you'll survive. Ya ayyul ladhina aminu stajibu lillahi wa rasul. Ida da'akum lima yuhyikum. Just obey Allah and his messenger when they call you to that which will give you life. So, the sunnah is like the ark of Noah. Salawatu Allahi wa salamu alayhi. Whoever rides it, he'll be saved. Whoever doesn't ride it, it'll be like Noah's son and the rest of the people. He'll be destroyed and he'll be drowned. Fadhi ya akhi. Uh, we dealt with this already in the beginning when we mentioned that moving too much, moving a lot in the prayer is a sign and an indication that someone is not concentrating. And you should only move if you have to move. There are some ahadith that are not authentic where a man was playing with his lihya. He had made wudu, so he's playing with his lihya. The hadith said, that the Nabi mentioned, sallallahu alaihi wasallam, if this guy, if this person's heart had khushur, his hand wouldn't be moving like that. The hadith is not authentic. So if a person is praying and he goes into rukur and he comes up and he has to fix his clothes because they're uncomfortable, then this is okay because what can he do? But it is the unnecessary movement in which you destroy the people, your neighbor and other people like that. This is what shouldn't happen because... The Prophet prohibited us, sallallahu alayhi wa sallam. He said, إِذَا أَتَيْتُمْ الْمَسْجِدْ فَعَلَيْكُمْ بِالْوَقَارِ وَالسَّكِينَةِ مَا أَدْرَكْتُمْ فَبِهِ خَيْرٌ وَمَا فَاتَكُمْ فَصَلُّوا If you come to the masjid, then take it easy. Don't come running. Have sakina and waqar. And you're coming to the masjid, the salah. What about when you're in the salah? You have to be sakina, sakin. He said about the prayer. Sallallahu alayhi wa sallam Inna fi salati la shughla The prayer is something you're already busy What you're going to read Concentrating What I ate you on You know it's Now we're going to add on to that All of those movements So the person has to Be very calm And very easy And very gentle While he was praying, he would tell them the tafsir of the ayat. While he was praying, no, it sounds um, sounds strange, gharib. I've never heard of that. Allah alam. If you find it, let us know. Fadhi ya akhi. When a person is praying, where does his eyes stare? We dealt with this. The mistake is to look around here and there. Where's the right place for the eyes? The place where the sajda is. So if he's bending down, he's going to look where he's going to make sajda. If he's standing up in qiyam, he's going to look to where he makes sajda. All in an attempt to help him to get focused and not to be looking around here and there. Last question. Like I mentioned, Akhi, if you're in a masjid of the Ahnaf, you know that they don't say it. So as to not make trouble, don't say it. Unless there are other people in that masjid and they're saying it and it's not going to be a problem. In my local masjid, Hanafi masjid, and there are enough people who are there, we're going to say, I mean, and it's not going to be a problem. But if you're in a masjid, it's going to be a problem, then don't say it. Because the imam is definitely not saying it. But if you're in a masjid, and you don't know that imam. You know, he's not Hanafi. You can have husna dhan. And you say it. Because there is a hadith that says, if the imam says, Dalin, say ameen. One hadith said, if the imam says, Dalin, Dalin, you say ameen. And then this other hadith, which is muqayyid, it is uh, restricted. 
if the imam says ameen, then you say ameen. So we carry the restricted one over that general one, as we mentioned in so many examples. So that's the fiqh of the issue, inshallah. Subhanak Allahumma wa bihamdika wa shadu wa la ilaha illa anta astaghfiruka wa tubu ilayk. Assalamu alaikum wa rahmatullahi wa barakatuh. You have my papers? Allahu Akbar, Allahu Akbar, Allahu Akbar, Allahu Akbar. Ashhadu an la ilaha illa Allah. Ashhadu an la ilaha illa Allah. Ashhadu anna Muhammadan Rasulullah. Ashhadu anna Muhammadan Rasulullah. Ya ala salah. Ya ala Ya ala al-falah Ya ala al-falah Allahu Akbar